Welcome to the Resume Storyteller, bringing you interviews with industry experts, regular folks who tested the job search waters and succeeded, and strategies to tell your story and land you job interviews. Here's your host, Virginia Franco. Hello, everyone. Virginia Franco here today. Um, Today, it is going to be just me. I am approaching the end of the year and I've sort of had some time to reflect and what I would, thought I would do, because people have told me that they find it very helpful when I write about this stuff, is talk a little bit about uh, resume straight, writing strategies that I use to overcome different career challenges. Um, you know, in my work as an executive resume writer, I do come across several common career challenges that are tricky. They really plague job seekers and they require a bit of strategy to address them. So I was able to sort of look through my roster of clients and um, I found four, right? I identified four different challenges that were pretty common. Um, And so what I thought I'd do is sort of take each one, discuss it a bit and share some of the writing techniques that I use to help, uh, help my clients to put their best foot forward on paper. So the four that we're going to talk about are number one, when someone is trying to make an industry or a career change. So sort of a more of a, you know, career 180. The second one is how to share your career story when you have held the same role basically over the course of your entire career, but you have been doing it sort of through a series of um shorter term projects where maybe every 18 to 24 months you sort of jump to the next opportunity. Um, The third one is what do you do if the past year really stunk for you and you had, you know, a great track record and then for whatever reason the past year has really stunk and then yeah, your job searching and, you know, you don't want the events of the past year to reflect poorly on you. And then the last one is age discrimination, sort of what to do if you're worried about appearing too old. So those are the four. So what I'd like to do is just start with the um, first one, which is trying to make an industry or a career change. Um, And I want to share the story of a client of mine who came to me about six, nine months into the pandemic. She found uh, the the COVID epidemic, bottom line, was a huge wake-up call for her. And she was a product manager in a Fortune 100 company, but she'd always volunteered for causes that were really important to her, pets and the environment and um, food insecurity, just a whole heap of ones. And she came to me and she's like, look, I am ready to take a leap and I really want to switch to a role that is um takes what i what i'm good at in corporate america but i want to do it for something that i really care about um and i want to move into nonprofit um so what we did was we sort of focused on um We focused heavily on her work with pets because that seemed to be where she spent the most time. And um, basically, she was a product project manager at her Fortune 100 role. And through her research, she discovered that there really was an opportunity to do the same sort of work um, in the nonprofit space. So the first thing we did to appeal to the new audience where we focused on making sure that her resume spoke in the lingo of nonprofit. So Every industry has sort of buzzwords and language that they use when they are, when you're talking in meetings and and it it impacts how you describe yourself when you're writing on your resume and your LinkedIn profile. So for instance, in nonprofit, or excuse me, back up, in for-profit corporate America, you talk a lot about profit margins. You talk a lot about profits. Um, that isn't language that gets used in nonprofit. Um, talking about how much money you make is sort of a no-no. Um, it's okay to talk about fundraising dollars, but you don't talk about um, how much you bring in top versus bottom line. So instead, a term like cost savings would be really, really applicable. Uh, would be sorry, that would be more of a term that you would use in the nonprofit world. Um, so 
speaking someone's lingo is key to helping the reader look at it and go, okay, this person gets my world. Some ways to understand um, what the lingo is are to you know listen to podcasts, read books, go on YouTube and look up videos of people that are in your space and listen to the wording that they are using or the phrasing they're using um, and tweak yours where applicable. Um, the other thing that's really important to understand when you're trying to make an industry or career change is to understand the different, the end goals with that industry. So as I alluded to earlier in the for-profit corporate world, usually revenues are the ultimate indicator of success. So everything is about either, you know, driving top line numbers through sales and things like that, or doing stuff to make it cheaper to um, get things done so that you're growing your profits. Um, that language is super different in, uh, or that's a very different angle than a nonprofit. Nonprofit, the role is to, the goal is to bring in donations, bring in, um, you know, grassroots donations, big formal, big donor corporate donations. Um, and to, you know, and then you also get, uh, approved or it's looked on fondly if your if your organization runs itself really leanly so that more of the nonprofit donation and fundraising can go to the cause. Um, so understanding those goals really impacts how I write about the how I write about her successes because I'm not going to be screaming about revenue numbers the whole time. Um, the third thing I want to make sure to include is an understanding of the pain points. Um, the good thing is that at the end of the day, most companies face similar struggles, whether they are using their funds and their resources wisely to managing projects on time and on budget. You know, these are, these are industry standards. So we, so what I do is I try to use stories to show how, um, how the person understands their struggles and how they solve similar ones in the past. Um, so I'll give you an example of a bullet point that I included in her resume to show how her corporate leadership style was really well suited for nonprofits. Um, we The bullet was about survey results. So we talked about how she earned top survey results for fostering a culture of inclusivity, earning teams, Ensuring teams had resources and knowledge necessary to feel engaged and empowered both pre and post COVID and to operate without business disruption. Um, that pain point was one that resonated both with, you know, the, the engagement and, and employment satisfaction is important in nonprofits. It's equally important in for-profit because turnover is a big deal and people want to mitigate it. Um, that's certainly been true in 2021 um, now as we're entering into the mass migrate, uh, mass resignation or great awakening, as people are calling it. So understanding those pain points um, that are common to both industries and speaking to it was also very helpful. So bottom line, what we did was we made sure in order to help her pivot for her, help her pivot for an industry change, we made sure to understand the lingo, understand the goals, and understand the pain points. And again, Becoming familiar with the organization or industry can be done readily thanks to articles and podcasts and YouTube videos. Another great way to do that is to reach out to people that are in the know. Um, have informational interviews with people that are doing these roles. Uh, use LinkedIn to maybe find people that came from similar backgrounds to yours and made pivots into the world that you're interested in going to so that you can learn how they did it. And ask them questions around differences that they noticed around lingo and around goals and pain points. Um, and that will help you to inform what you write. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is how to share a career story when you have been in the same role over the course of many years. Um, and I'll use the example of a project manager who came to me and this person had sent me a resume that was five pages long. It had a combined history of 15 different roles. Um, fortunately, he knew that his resume was tough to read and he knew people might get lost. Um, and as we know, when something's tough to read and something is long and something's in, uh, so the person's in a rush, you run the risk that they might just skip it altogether. So what we did to make 
this a skimmable, compelling read was I really tried to work to get it to about two pages. And, and what I did, first and foremost, I had a summary section at the very top that said, um, that sort of pulled together uh, how it talked about how he had been pulled onto high profile projects every 12 to eight months because of his talents. And I outlined the talents that he um, brought to the table. In this case, he was really good at um, solving regulatory challenges, um, bringing projects that were off the rails back on the rails, um, building tools that helped people, that helped the projects to um, run more efficiently and help people to do their jobs better while that was going on. Um, so that summary paragraph at the top basically set the stage for the understanding that every 12 to 18 months, this person was regularly thrown onto new assignments, but it was, um, you know, based on, on skills that were really marketable. The se second thing that I did was I bundled like projects together. So what this allowed me to do was turn five roles into one um, through certain groupings. So for instance, from 2010 to 2015, I bundled together that he'd been an IT project manager working on software implementations and upgrades. Um, so this um, let me, so that was a job title that he um that he was a software implementation and upgrade project manager. And then each of the bullets below that job title were different projects he worked on. And so that turned like an entire page worth of uh, projects into something that was, you know, four or five bullets and two lines at the top to sort of explain it. So it's really, really saved on real estate um, and it made it easier to read. The other thing that I really focused on was describing how he had left his mark. So in addition to showing scope by including a range of the budget and talent resources that he that were critical to each job title, I listed each project as a bullet under that job title, like I said earlier. And I used the bullet to explain the problem he solved and the solution, the tech solution that he led to fix it. Um. So this is sort of a real change in how you describe projects, um, sort of understanding that fundamentally the projects had commonality. I called out the things that made them different, which in this case were um, what the problem was that he solved and what made it, what made it a, a teeny bit different. Um, so what this allowed the reader to do at the end of the day by doing bundled projects using a summary section and describing how you left his left your mark in each of the bullets it allowed for a skim read and it helped a great deal to um to really streamline the story okay so that is challenge number two challenge number three is what to do if you've had a lackluster recent experience um, and that happens, um, especially when industries get hard hit. So the story that I want to tell to help you guys with this one is a client of mine. Um, we'll call him Eric. And Eric had been a rock star. He, you know, had year over year of solving problems, putting out fires, growing revenues um, from like 2012 all the way up to 2019. And then in 2019, he got diagnosed with stage four cancer. Um, he continued to work, which was a miracle in and of itself. But his, you know, his performance, he barely hung on. It just really wasn't stellar. Um, by the grace of God and his treatments, he went into remission. And then we enter into 2020. And his industry took a beating during COVID. His company restructure, it laid people off. And people got laid off. And again, his numbers really were not great. So now he's got two past years of really bad numbers. And he was worried that this would really impact his ability to get tired. So what I did was I provided some context around the events of 19 and 20, 2019, 2020, to tell a story. I, I reframed it as a story of someone who is able to deal or succeed against the odds. So what we did for 2019, which was the year when he was dealing with cancer, um, even though his numbers didn't look great, 
his employee survey results were amazing. They were out of this world. In fact, they exceeded both industry and company benchmarks. So we talked about his success during that period. Um, for 2020, um, when COVID was killing him, his numbers, again, weren't great, but they were still way better than other divisions in his company. Um, and in addition, he was able to retain 100% of his customers when a lot of his other competitors were losing people left and right. So for 2020, this is the story that we told. Um, so what we did was, you know, we sort of pivoted as to the numbers that we told and told a story that was still equally real, but um, it was powerful in a different way. So it allowed me to show this guy as someone who has been a continuous winner over and over again in the last two years, really succeeding against the odds. Um, okay. The last challenge that I want to talk about is, uh, you know, age discrimination it happens all the time. Um, people worry about it and, you know, I'm not going to lie and say age discrimination doesn't happen. Um, and this person that was just, it was a worry that she had that no matter how we talked about it, it was something that was going to weigh on her heavily. It was going to impact her um, interviews and all of that. So I said, okay, fine. We will really work to um, mitigate your career history that, you know, we, we don't want the reader to know if you're 35 or 85. Um, the problem with her was that if we, by eliminate, so usually, let me back up. Usually what I do is when someone, in order to make them timeless, I focus on the last 15 years of experience. So in 2021, that meant I really cover 2006 to present. I will create an earlier experience section and then synopsize anything that happened in pre-2006. Um, the problem with this client though, is that by doing that approach, it eliminated a lot of really relevant roles that were where she did some really good stuff and they were super relevant to what she wanted to do next. So she was sort of in a catch-22. Um, it, it included, she faced age discrimination, eliminated, and she feared the key, ex key experience would be discounted and pigeonholed her. Um, in this case, she was applying for an HR role and she wanted didn't want to be viewed as a one industry type HR person. And all of her earlier stuff was, was other industries. Um, to make things even more complex with this client, after working with top tier companies as an HR business partner back in the 80s and 90s, then she left the workforce for 14 years to raise kids. And um, then she returned to the work to work full time in 2011. Um, so it didn't look like she has, had as many years of experience under her belt if we sort of focus on the strategy that I outlined at the beginning. So this is what we did to sort of try to balance out keeping her timeless with highlighting her stuff from the 80s and 90s that was relevant. Again, the key is relevant. If someone scooped ice cream at Baskin Robbins and you want to be an HR business partner, I probably don't need to reference that earlier role if it happened in 1982. But if she was uh, an employee relations manager at a big Fortune 100, then I don't want to have that overlooked. Um, so what I did was, number one, I engaged in a bit of name dropping. In the summary section at the very top of page one, I referenced her work for these top tier companies. She had worked at Dell. She had worked at Boeing. She had worked at Wells Fargo. Um, not only are those super well known, um, each of those is in a different industry. Wells is uh, banking, um, Boeing is aerospace and Dell is tech. Um, so that allowed her to, allowed me to position her for the role that she wanted. And she wa really wanted to be known as someone that could really pivot from industry to industry. She did not, she was an advertising nature and she really wanted to get away from that. Um, the second thing that I did was I highlighted industry diversity by creating an additional career experience where we did list the roles and the job titles that she held. Um, but here's the, the key rather than, so usually what I said I do is I will, in the earlier experience, I will um, remove the dates from it. In this case, what I did was I actually listed the number of years that she did each one. So under Wells, I put two years, under Boeing, I did one year, and under Dell, I did three. Um, 
And this is sort of a strategy I don't use all the time, but um, in this case, it was really important to sort of show that her earlier experience was really valid. It wasn't just a six month deal, one and done. So instead of saying, you know, December 88 to January 1990, we just wrote two years um, under that earlier experience section. So I hope that that is a strategy that will help you if you are struggling with having some really, really relevant, cool, older stuff. Um, But you also don't want to show that you are whatever age you're concerned about. Um, So those are the four challenges. I hope that you found them helpful. If you have a common challenge and you're ever curious as to how to overcome it, give me a call and I'm happy to brainstorm. You've been listening to The Resume Storyteller with Virginia Franco. To learn more about storytelling strategies to catch the eye of today's online skim hiring and decision makers, please visit www.virginiafrancoresumes.com.